In my half an hour, I'm going to bring the conversations back to the classrooms, studios, workshops, uh, sports fields, uh, parks, wherever your learning takes place, wherever teachers and young people are interacting together. Um, I loved Eric's presentation yesterday, uh, but I was sad when uh, he kind of got us to say that everything we'd done in our life to make us talented was probably nothing to do with school. Because I take a very different view, and looking at and listening to the wonderful singer we had this morning, the wonderful athletes we watched last night reflecting on the Olympics, and indeed that fantastic band, I thought, you know what, I think this is a real partnership, and these guys have learned what they've learned, partly at school and partly not at school. But I want to focus on the school bit especially. Uh, by the way, Kirsty ambushed me for that little question about uh, Tanya and my school life. And if she'd asked me another question, I would have said that after school it all went downhill. I went to uh, quite a well-known university, Oxford in fact, and I floundered for the first year. Because I had been taught brilliantly by a brilliant teacher who'd given me, helped me to have a passionate love of literature. There was just one thing he hadn't done. He really hadn't allowed me to think for myself. And he really hadn't allowed me to move beyond the, what was then S level and A level constraints of saying clever things about nice and wonderful and stimulating writing. So it's a journey, it's a difficult one, and some of the things I'm gonna be talking about are complicated, interesting, worthwhile, and very, very much doable. So um, let's get going. Uh, Pedagogy Unplugged, if you like, is to uh, me trying to do three things. First of all, a little warm-up, just to check that we're, uh, we're thinking and coming at this from at least a similar enough perspective. Secondly, I'm going to rehearse the questions that uh, I think you might like to ask about generating a pedagogy or pedagogies. And then thirdly, I'm going to offer you, and it'll have to be in fairly quick order, a sort of decision-making tree that helps us understand the different kinds of decisions that we take daily, monthly, termly, yearly, and even longer than that when we're looking at education systems. So here, here goes. Let's just check, first of all, um, how that prefrontal cortex is, because um, uh, I know we had a very nice evening last night. Um, would you just uh, do me a favor and choose a card, please? One of those, one of those five cards to the exclusion of the other four. Have you all got one? Great. I can't see, but I'm assuming that you have. Um, just wave a hand if you've all chosen. Fantastic, okay. Um, and I'm now going to predict which card you've all chosen. Is that believable? We did have a good evening last night, didn't we? But even so, it's kind of ludicrously not uh, plausible, is it? Because, uh, in fact, some of the more sceptical among you now have jumped ship, haven't you, and chosen another card on the grounds that anyone who comes along and uh, tries this kind of trick on you is not to be encouraged. So, uh, okay, just humour me. In fact, it's not me. This is a, a lovely idea from a, a Scottish educational philosopher called Andy Clark in a great book called Natural Born Cyborg. And so close your eyes and I'll, I'll prove you wrong. Okay, close your eyes and I've removed your card. So there, was a, there was a kind of modest clap over there. Uh, <clears throat> um, now look again, look again. Uh, let's just go back. What have I actually done? Oh, I've removed them all. Okay. Now, those of us with, uh, those of us who've worked with government for some years know this is a bit like how government does consultation with us, isn't it? It says, hey guys, here are, we really value you. Here are five things that you might like to think. And we say, no, 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 no. And uh, we give them our very thoughtful uh, uh, and carefully uh, worked out answers. And they take the whole lot away and give us four they thought of in the beginning. This is inattentional blindness, colleagues, and what I'd like you to hold is that little trick as an image for yourself as a leader or yourself as a teacher as we go through the next uh, 25 minutes together. What are you not noticing that if you noticed more carefully, you might be an even greater teacher? So this word pedagogy is much misunderstood. You're confusing. It's a lot, I don't know about that. I'm not even sure it's the right word. Um, it's not much used, actually, although occasionally there have been uh, uh, flights of fancy recently, people beginning to give it a, an airing. I don't know if it's the right word or not, but I think it's a little bit more precise than teaching and learning. In Germany, there's a German word for it. In America, um, instructional design is the phrase used. Uh, on Europe, it's widely used. It would be kind of like you go to a doctor and ask a doctor what, what kind of things are important to you, and biology is right up there. 
I'm going to argue that if we're going to be really effective teachers, understanding, and here's a working definition, understanding the science, art, and craft of teaching and learning is really important, and that's what pedagogy involves. It also includes the broader learning culture and the values which inform all interactions. At a practical level, it's the decisions that we take day in, day out. And I'm going to focus on those decisions when we get towards the end of what I have to say. But before we can even get off the starting block, we need to think as, and here I'm going to be standing on the shoulders of Dylan and Guy and Eric and Tanya, who made me laugh this morning. Uh, wonderful. I, I, I so empathize. I remember carrying um, my small son around and looking on in astonishment as he projectile vomited over several very important people who seem to think I ought to be rather better at being a dad. And it's very humbling when that happens. And on the sh shoulders of Brian too, and Sue earlier when she started off, we delighted Guy and I to be involved in the Redesigning School Initiative, and James this morning, who uh, really needs to be taken to see Mr. Gove and uh, uh, shown, and is an absolutely shining example of what goes on now under our very noses in kitchens and classrooms near us. So pedagogy for what is the question, isn't it? It was the question that was swimming through yesterday. What kind of life are we uh, trying to train and, and educate and uh, help young people become? Are they for cliff edge climbers? Are they for uh, wonderful potters? who are going to be manipulate as well as articulate? Are they for the kind of jazz musicians that we might imagine who are even one step different from those uh, so well organized and professional young people last night because they're riffing and making it up and it's a non-routine expertise they have? Is it the ultimate Apollo 13 experience that we're, we're preparing young people for when, as was said yesterday in Piaget's lovely definition of intelligence, they truly uh, will know what to do when they haven't the foggiest what to do because everything's gone very peculiar up in space, as Jim Lovell reminded us. Houston, we have a problem. Or is it uh, we're developing people so they'll be same kinds of or different kinds of teachers or good mums or dads or parents or carers or step parents because our life is so much complicated, more complicated, isn't it, than we imagined? Or a great engineer. Here's a, a, a girl clearly being that great engineer. What are we trying to prepare young people for? Because that's the answer we'll have to, have to have a really clear view of before we can say, ah, so that's the learning method or teaching method I'm going to be choosing. And yesterday, I think, it was really, really clear that there's a, there's a growing consensus in this room, in SSAT and in the many schools and other organizations represented here, that the education we want is expansive. That's to say, and we've had so many lists, haven't we, today, yesterday, from various speakers about what these desirable habits of mind or dispositions might be, and we don't disagree, do we? The OECD recently has uh, published some nice writing about learning environments and adaptability is its 21st century core skill. And we've had another, another long list uh, today from the CBI, and it's very, very impressive. I, like Brian, urge you to read the report of last week. It's a very supportive report about what we might be doing. But broadly speaking, we are saying, are we not, that there are some capabilities which really matter, and I think we're saying that our job is to identify them, to coach them, to expand them, to cultivate them, and I think that we're saying that those are indeed cultivatable, that learning is learnable and intelligence is expandable. That 75% bit that Tanya was playing with, that isn't just the IQ bit at the heart. Incidentally, of course, the inventor of IQ, Alfred Binet himself, did not think that IQ was fixed. Isn't that interesting? It's uh, had a bad press. So if we believe that, that's going, to, that's going to leave us with a whole series of much more interesting questions to work out, isn't it, when we come to designing our pedagogy. Um, we've got some bad role models, by the way, out there, haven't we? Um, uh, Homer's uh, uh, wretched insistence on a fixed mindset and we have some fantastic academic role models out there and practitioner role models who are building on the work of people like Lauren Resnick, or David Perkins, and uh, especially, I think, in the teaching domain of Carol Dweck. Um, Carol Dweck's powerful notion that it's not some kind of piece of uh, her, uh, folk, folksy theory that if you believe you can get better, you will. It's actually the case 
Attainment improves, so do your learning attributes. If you genuinely, truthfully believe that you can exercise that mind and make it fitter and stronger. And that's a fantastically important underpinning for any classroom learning designed environment that we might be in. If we think that, then our pedagogic choices will be different. The language will matter hugely. It's not whether or not you flip the classroom, although that's interesting, or whether or not you have a particular environment. It's as much important as how we use words in that environment, what role modelling of our own beliefs and attitudes we're presenting to young people. Um, I want to offer different images from old views of pedagogy, that we were somehow a little vessel that had to be picked, filled up with knowledge and skills and whatever's from a, a bygone era, or, as you may think of it, a tabula rasa, something that emerges with nothing. They know a nothing, and it's my job to kind of figure out at key stage one, or early years, and then key stage one, and key stage two, three, and we gradually boot them out, and then they kind of divide and maybe go to college, or maybe go to university, or maybe not, if they're in that... Um, dread, dreadful acronym, neat group, really kind of struggling and not flourishing and needing the kind of resilience that Tanya was talking about. So it's not like that at all, is it? Our image needs to be quite different. It needs to be around, come backstage with me. My pedagogical design is to make everything visible. Whether you're walking down the corridors and looking at work in progress being displayed and annotated, a poem in progress is a heck of a lot more interesting, often, isn't it, than the final thing. And another image I'd be offering would be kids right up there on the bridge, not down in the engine room, although they will have to be there sometimes. And I'm going to suggest when we look at the decisions we take, these are not binary decisions. As uh, Brian was intimating, let's not get into silly discussions about knowledge or skills. It's very, very yesterday. So... Um, what could I offer you? Well, as a mental frame here, I could certainly offer you some really helpful work from David Perkins. If you don't know his work, the whole game of learning, uh, as well as being a lovely metaphor, is a really precise, forensically interesting description of the kind of things that need to be in place if we are to get the kind of learning that I've just been talking about. Um, not time to dwell on, on these, but I think something about the authenticity strikes home, doesn't it? It's not just Tanya's daughter who's worrying about uh, e momentum equations. Uh, many of our kids aren't quite yet convinced that the theory or formula or something that we're trying to get them to learn is really going to be useful ever to them. We've kind of done the just, just in case bit, uh, perhaps to death. Uh, playing out of town is really important, just as we learned yesterday, uh, deliberate practice is really important. And therefore, our pedagogy is going to have to be flexible enough to say, yes, we can do this over here, but actually we maybe need to be virtual to get a, a broader experience of what it might, like, might be like. That's why, of course, uh, teams that play at home then suddenly find a wrong kind of grass when they go and play away, and it's difficult. Uh, David Perkins has a lovely couple of nouns that he uses to describe the wrong kind of pedagogy. And these are elementitis and aboutitis. Elementitis is that when we frustrate learners from the whole game of learning, be like learning Scrabble, and instead of a, playing the game of Scrabble, I say, right, you lot, I want you to think of three letter words beginning with Z, and you, you lot, I want you to think of five letter words with funny endings. And that would be a very dispiriting experience. Aboutitis is another problem, isn't it? And it's a pedagogical virus, I think. When instead of allowing young people to experience it at first hand, we spend 55% of the time telling them how to do it, and then 5% of the time, sorry, 95, my percentages let me down, and then 5% um, they're actually doing it. Oh, time to go to the next lesson. Bad luck. It is, as John Hattie has reminded us in his very practical successor volume to Visible Learning, it is about the mind frame that we bring to the job. Later on, Ian Potter and I will be running a session where we begin to share how great educators across uh, England and Wales and indeed uh, the world now, we've got a, a sister organisation in Australia, are seeing the job of expansive education as not just being about identifying and expanding capabilities, but switching the way we do professional development so that the... Uh, the classroom is not only a laboratory, a mind gym for the kids, it's also a laboratory and mind gym for the adults. It's where we sharpen our own research skills. That's our small r, research skills. We get better at noticing 
And that has to be the pedagogic imperative, it seems to me. So, if we're going to create any pedagogy, we've got to work our way through what we think this is all about, what are the outcomes here, and that's a great challenge that the CBI have set us, as Brian is saying. We've got to figure out whether teaching Latin might be marginally different from uh, getting better at dealing with bereavement, or um, playing a blinder on a sports field, or dealing with difficult and complicated things where there is no right answer. You know, will those be different? I think they will. And what, what pedagogical approaches may they, uh, may they beg? We've got to really understand our learners, haven't we? We've got to get inside in far, so far as they'll let us, uh, and we can encourage them to let us. We've got to understand what, what they're bringing to this, their prior learning, their prior experiences. We've got to have a very broad and sophisticated palette of possible learning methods from which we might, to continue the metaphor, paint the lesson. And that's really, really important. It's all too easy just to shrink that down to a very narrow and rather arid set or crop of possible methods. And then the context is going to be so important, isn't it? We know context matters in learning and in life. We know that we might be very good at mixing it and having a really sophisticated and interesting conversation over the dinner table, back in our kitchen, but less so when we have to do it in another arena, and, and so on, and so on. So what are the answers to those questions? These little colors, just to go back, are a little kind of visual semiotic clue, if you like. So what are the outcomes that we're looking? And I think there are four powerful outcomes, almost whatever ever domain you're in. One is uh, something that sometimes gets called skill, um, but it's the ability to do something, whatever that something is, or to think something, or to use knowledge in some way, in a routine and predictable way. And the ways we, that we might learn that will certainly involve, in many cases, demonstration and practice and use and making mistakes and feedback and reflection, uh, and that's, that's, that's very powerful and, and necessary. Uh, sorry, just too quick there. Um, and resourcefulness is non-routine expertise, what we were talking about yesterday. All those things that we need to be able to do, and we haven't actually encountered it beforehand. That's most of life, isn't it? I mean, surely that's what a 21st century pedagogy has to prepare for the unexpected, doesn't it? It has to equip young people to be able to do things that they didn't know they were going to have to do. Dylan was telling us, you know, we can't even tell uh, um, what the jobs will be a few years ahead, let alone how many of them will be available to us. An ethic of excellence is a lovely phrase that I'm taking from Ron Berger's work. If you don't know it, I commend it to you. And it's what came to my mind as I watched and listened to the band last night. Those young people were professional musicians. They were so in the moment. Their pride was palpable. They were completely devoted to what they were doing. They were striving after a kind of excellence which was coming intrinsically to what they're doing. And also, they were listening to what was going on. By the by, the conductor was fantastic too. Did you see him conducting and mixing at the same time? Quite extraordinary in terms of higher order use of the prefrontal cortex. And finally, we absolutely have to have this other thing going on, the wider skills for learning, so that we can uh, be more explicit. What do I mean by wider skills? Well, how many of you have watched Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? What do you do when you get stuck? Shout it out. Feel free. Phone a friend. Ask the audience. Go 50-50, absolutely. Cough loudly if you want to cheat. Um, no, um, but you do, those are good learning strategies, are they not? Narrowing the odds, asking your peer group, depends who your peer group is, and phoning a friend who's normally attached to Google, yeah? So they're pretty neat, wider skills. And we need a massive drop-down menu that appears in the back of our mind's eye when we're thinking, how am I going to do this? Now remember, this blue, blue, blue one uh, keys us still into, uh, what are we trying to do here? Well, of course we've got to get the best possible results by whatever examination system we find ourselves in, but there's that other game of life, isn't there? The game that was being so eloquently described yesterday. Hey, guess what? If you get better at the second game of life, the results go up. Hey, guess what? If you get better at the first game of life, the results do go up, but you don't necessarily produce learners who can learn whatever they need to learn in an uncertain world. And we certainly don't want that, do we? We don't want that to be the outcome of our pedagogy. 
So how do we do that? It was an interesting conversation yesterday about intuition. I think maybe Guy was mentioning it. How do we know whether somebody's intuitively developing or just daydreaming? It's very difficult. As I said, these are complicated, interesting questions. Guy and I have just recently finished some work uh, looking at vocational and practical pedagogy. It'll be launched, in fact, tomorrow. It's quite a week. And uh, uh, we hope it's going to change the way FE colleges and all those schools really interested in practical learning will think about this. We're playing with an idea that you might be able to put most... These are FE college subject titles, but you could substitute your own subjects. You might get some interesting traction if you thought about those predominantly working with physical materials, predominantly with people, and probably and predominantly with symbols, uh, uh, um, uh, letters and, and formulae and, and numbers uh, and uh, all the rest of it. And we're just beginning to do some thinking about that. Not time to share that here, but that might be part of what any good teacher is trying to go through when they're deciding what method will I use here. What kind of learners am I dealing with? What frame of mind do they have? What are they bringing to the party? What kind of expectations do they have? What kind of view do they have of me sitting there? Some frighteningly and wonderfully honest reflections from Tanya about her own kids, and I can think of my own 21-year-old in very similar vein. He's just becoming very nice, but it's taken a little while. It's a long game we're playing, isn't it? There are a huge range of possible methods, and again, I don't have time to explore them, but unless we're familiar enough with them, I think we arguably do ourselves a disservice, and we certainly do the young people that we're working with a disservice. We need to know, don't we, which of these we might use in which context, for which subject, for which purpose. And that's only the first of two lists. The second list goes on. And learning on the fly is part of learning, isn't it? Those kind of unexpected chance encounters that we have. How can we cause them to happen more often? And latterly, we were talking yesterday with Eric about the use of uh, virtual environments uh, very clearly by flipping the classroom. But we can learn from role play and simulation and indeed from the gaming industry too, I think. Some very interesting work there by Future, Future Lab, if you're interested. And finally then, the actual context of school. And that might be context, context as in is it a drama studio or a laboratory, or it might be context as in the affordances of the space in which you find yourself and how that works for you. It may be a very lovely space, it may be a rather cramped rectangular space that still has desks irritatingly almost fixed to the ground. Even James this morning showing us the iPod, uh, iPads in situ had a remarkably classroom-shaped classroom on which those kids were looking at those iPads. How interesting. So, and this is where the real work begins, and I have five and a half minutes to share it with you. So if we're going to really understand this, and this is emergent work in practice, then we have a series of choices that we need to make day in, day out. If we want to achieve that outstanding teaching and learning, it's not about ticking boxes. It is about taking some very careful and thoughtful decisions. Here's the first one. What's my role in this space? Am I more at the facilitative end? All of yesterday has been about that, and some of today. Or I'm, am I at the didactic end? But before I fall into my own trap, this is not a crude either-or. This is not a binary didactic bad, facilitative good or didactic yesterday, facilitative of today. This is not about that. This is about which situations, which, which subject, with what outcomes, might this be a more appropriate way of operating. And I think there's no doubt, I'm a, um, my, as you now know, uh, my passion is English literature and, uh, and language, and there's something in that domain called the great vowel shift. I won't bore you with what it is, but it's very interesting. If, you, if you've got a longer time, I'll share it with you. This is the great pedagogy shift that we're experiencing. And it is moving in that direction. Not like night after day, not only, because what is more compelling than a really powerfully um, if, uh, uh, effective uh, practitioner, let's say of a a musician demonstrating something to us, or a potter demonstrating to us, or a great mathematician working out loud what a formula actually is. That can be very, very, very powerful, but not if it's all the time, 
or not if it's the predominant thoughtless mode of instruction. The second axis is the nature of the activities. And again, I hope you'll feel I'm just standing now very comfortably on the shoulders, maybe sitting would be more comfortable, on the shoulders of the previous speakers over the last few days. Because we need to move it to the left, don't we? And I don't mean that authentic means we simply have to give them more and more and more of their lived experience. It wouldn't be... It's nice sometimes to think about um, how much change you have from an imagined trip to the supermarket. But if that's the level of your mathematical experience, then we're denying kids the joy and pleasure of more complex mathematical activity. But authenticity, if you want to go read, people like Barbara McCombs in the States, her work on this, very, very powerful indeed. Our attitude to knowledge is critically important. If we're smug knowers, as opposed to great questioners, that'll come across. As Guy was arguing yesterday, you can't not do this stuff. Your attitudes will be transmitted, and we are a powerful role model in the pedagogic space in which we put ourselves, wherever that is. Go look at Ellen Langer's work on this, on her um, confident assertion that could be language is much more engaging than is language. If I say this is a complex and interesting matter, this pedagogy stuff, it could be about this or that or that, and it's a set of complicated... Com that's it got you engaged. If I say this pedagogy is straightforward, what you've got to do is on Monday morning, OK, you're, you're already, can I, yeah? You've, it, that's not co-construction. It's not engaging. So much more questioning and much less certainty is of the order. It may be convenient to timetablers to have subjects organised in the way that we have done. I used to be one myself. But it isn't necessarily conducive to learning. How can we go beyond that? How can we extend in ways many of the schools here are doing, many of the organisations that we're working with um, in the Expansive Education Network are, are making this a statement of being. Not just in secondary school, we do that for year seven, but it gets too complicated after that but schools that really take this seriously. What about the organisation of space? Surely, as we are homo sapiens, it's a tool-making animal, tool-creating animal. So we need to be, we thrive in a workshop environment where we can go get the tool when we need it, not have to reach up for dictionaries that are out of our reach, not have to go to cupboards that are locked, not, not have, sorry, that's too many negatives, isn't it? But you know what I mean. We need spaces which have work-in-progress opportunities. That's where we're going to have wonderful opportunities for learning on the fly and for practicing the approach that um, Lois Hetland and her colleagues in Project Zero have shown is so valuable in that student reflective critique that we need to teach kids if group work is going to be the rigorous important activity that I think it should be and can be. So we need to be, move beyond a little bit of Edward de Bono's six thinking hats and embed this in complicated jigsaw-type approaches where we're really looking at how we construct a group task. When you get into the workplace, you'll come across all sorts of psychometrics to do with team roles. We need to have that in school, don't we? That's a critical part of how learners perform together. One of the most important life school skills is, after all, getting on with people who somehow seem, seem to see the world in different ways from your own. John Hattie's Visible Learning and much of the writing over years that has, broadly speaking, been looking at metacognition has shown how we absolutely have to take kids backstage. We absolutely have to tell them what's going on as it's going on in real time. The literature of learning transfer is full of this too. If we want kids to be able to use something in the maths room, kitchen, and then over on the sports field, we need to have them have models and ways of getting at it when they need to get at it. And that's very important indeed. We're nearly there. Thank you for your patience. Just 30 seconds to go. In a virtual world, we need to recognise when we need to do less and be further away, both metaphorically and literally. That's been a theme, hasn't it? We need to teach less. And that will paradoxically, as Brian was suggesting, and as John Hattie has done, lead to more learning. And the flip side, of course, is the learner needs to be up there on the bridge with the compass, with uh, the so sure and certain knowledge that she or he has the best possible chance of co-creating with us because we listen and we have that rich palette of possible methods to the conversations that we're about to have about pedagogy. We may not use that word. As I say, I don't know whether it's the right word or not, but I know that it has some knowings and sciences and questions that are just as important as 
the knowingses and sciences and questions that a good GP will have when she or he's talking to you, or indeed a good clinical psychologist, uh, as so ably demonstrated earlier on. So if you like any of that, come join Ian and me in my uh, workshop after this. Uh, I wish I could pull a stunt like James and say 25% off if you join the Expansive Education Network today, but I can nearly 20% off if you join the Expansive Education Network. See, I'm not a very good salesperson, am I? But here we go. If you like any of this stuff, then uh, there's lots of things that Guy and I have written that you can download for free from our site with that ridiculous URL. And finally, Building Learning Power, which you were kind enough to mention earlier on, Kirsty, which is very much Guy's creation, and I'm absolutely delighted to be chairman of the company that produces that and to be working with so many great schools doing that and Habits of Mind and Philosophy for Children and Thinking Schools and, and, and all the wonderful things that are represented by the pioneering organisations in this room. Thank you very, very much indeed.